Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Monies with Mover. I am Mover, C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. On today's video, it is part two of my interview with Splint. I hope you guys will enjoy it. Thanks for watching. All right, we're back. Um, so tell me about the mission of the U-2 and kind of what it's like to fly that airplane. Yeah, so uh, ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance, is kind of the bread and butter of what, we're, what we do in the U-2. So, you know, you could Google articles about what the actual mission of the jet is. It's, uh, it's been around a long time, so it's uh, nothing really new there, uh, nothing that you haven't already heard. But the big thing that I always am impressed with, I think, is just things that you don't really think about is just how big of a team uh, is involved to make the, a mission happen. So we could talk about, you know, I mean, think about how many maintainers are out there working day and night to get the airplane to launch. Uh, in cases of, on actual missions, you know, you'll see they'll prep the jet all night. They'll see, see me launch in the morning, and then they have a shift change around noon. I'm gone for however long, you know, sometimes up to, you know, 12 hours. And then I come back, and there's a new team there. They see me land, and they get the jet turned and, and ready. They work all night, and then they shift change at midnight. The other people who had launched me, you know, on the mission the day prior, they're now back, and, and there's just a jet there. You know, the jet came back. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy just how big of a team it is to do that. And then not to mention the, the PSD troops that maintain our suits. You know, we rely on them to, to strap us into the jet. Um, Something crazy is that part of our training, you go into an altitude chamber with a suit. This is kind of a, a confidence uh, building, uh, I guess, maneuver or uh, something for our training so that we can see, yeah, hey, this suit does work. So they actually take us into an altitude chamber and raise the, the altitude uh, above 70,000 feet. So the, the suit actually inflates uh, the Armstrong line. At about 63,000 feet, liquids will boil at room temperature. So they have a beaker of water in front of you that's sitting there, and it starts boiling. So you're in this room with water that's boiling at room temperature, and you're like, wow. all right, this thing works. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of a surreal moment. And they're, they're on the other side of this really thick glass where they're safe. You know, they're, like, looking at you like, hey, see, it works. Okay, yeah, I guess it does. So, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's incredible the amount of work that they do um, every single day to, to get the suits ready and, and, and keep us alive and, and get us out there. Uh, they strap us into the jet. Um, they, yeah, so it, it's, that's a big team. And then not to mention, you know, of course, you have uh, sensors and whatnot. Um, won't get into specifics on those, but, you know, there's a huge amount of people that are, that are working behind the scenes on that. And then... Of course, you have intelligence, the intel troops that, that are out there that are, uh, you know, looking at everything that, that we go out and, and do and then, you know, analyze all that. So, I mean, the amount of people that are involved beyond just the pilot is, is kind of, uh, it's humbling. You know, it's, it's crazy that, you know, all these people work, and, you know, are, are working that all have incredibly, you know, demanding jobs. And, and then, you know, you go out there and you have one small piece of it and we get... We get all the glory, as, as you know, as a fighter dude, you know, as the fighter pilot gets all the glory, right? <laughs> so, but um, but it, it is, it's, you have to look and, and just see that you are just another piece of the puzzle uh, of this very, very, very large team. Um, and, yeah, I think that's that's something that's pretty pretty cool about the mission with the, uh, the U-2 that I did not know about until I uh, got into the program. What's it like to fly it? Let's talk more like yeah. it's it's a high altitude aircraft sure. with a you're basically both on the overspeed and stall margin at the same time. Yeah, they talk about that. That's the coffin corner. So they talk about you know knots, a uh, few knots from from overspeeding the aircraft as well as uh, stalling it out. So yeah, the funny thing is is we have, we fly. Uh, Official altitude is above 70,000 feet. That's that's what you're going to hear from any U-2 pilot. So that's uh, that's where we fly. And uh, you can click the autopilot off, and, man, it, it flies so nice. Uh, and, it, yeah, you would love it, dude. It, it's, it's just a, a great flying airplane up high. Down low, though, it, it's, it's really heavy. So something that probably a lot of people don't know about is that it is it's cables and pulleys, so you're actually manipulating flight controls yourself. So it's not hydraulics. 
uh, some of the stuff like speed brakes, you know, that type, those types of things. Yeah. But as far as the actual flight controls, what you're manipulating with the yoke, that's going to be you. So as you accelerate in the jet, it does get heavier and you can absolutely feel it. The, uh, you know, the trying to get the flight control surfaces into the wind that you're wrestling it, it. It's, it's pretty awesome. And then as you slow down, of course it gets a little bit lighter and then, yeah. But the big thing is, is the landing, right? Mm. So that's where that's where we kind of make our money. That's where you can get hired, and uh, yeah. So that's that's the big thing about U two pilots is is landing this thing because it's it's like what do they say? Is it's like landing a, a bicycle on a tightrope or something like that? It's 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 pretty it's tough because it is a bicycle style landing gear, and and you have to be able. It's a tailwheel, which is also unique. A jet powered tailwheel. Do you get tailwheel uh, time out of this? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. It, it, we aren't logging it at least in our squadron, <laughs> but you know, I think, I think all of us consider it tailwheel time. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. But yeah, so it's a, a jet powered tail dragger essentially. But yeah, landing it is where the challenge is because you got to fly it down. You have a chase car. One thing is another is being driven by another U two pilot, which is cool, yeah. right? Which is I mean, fun. it's usually a pretty cool car. Yeah, that's it's it's not a bad deal. So yeah, we have uh, we have Dodge Chargers right now. We had a uh, Chevy Camaros. They've had Mustangs. They've had El Caminos back in the day. Awesome. They've had all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and then when we go overseas, uh, sometimes if we don't have a vehicle there, we'll rent one. So if you've seen in the, you can see some pictures of us driving Teslas, uh, chasing the U two. There's some with a uh, Jaguar. I had a, uh, there was a, I got to rent a Mercedes. It was like AMG. And the thing was insanely fast. It's like 600 horsepower twin turbo car. <laughs> so nice. yeah, as a car guy too, yeah. you know, I really appreciated that. And yeah, they've had F-type Jaguars. And I think someone said that they had a, a Porsche, uh, some sort of Porsche they were chasing uh, nice. at a local place uh, let them borrow. So yeah, it's pretty cool. So we got all sorts of stuff, but yeah, the, Big thing with that is, is you have another kind of like you think of it from mutual support. Think about a fighter's fly. You guys have you fly in, in pairs. You got a wingman with you, and uh, we fly alone. So by having a chase car driver being another U two pilot, they have checklists. They have the knowledge of having gone through the program, so and experience and all that. So they're able to talk to you on a radio and essentially be your backup. But Another part of the job is chasing you down the runway, and that's uh, basically they, they start their calls at 10 feet, and that's what you're going to hear on the majority of your YouTube videos. So 10 feet all the way down to ideally would be 2 feet is where you fly the U2 down to and then hold it there until it essentially stalls, runs out of flying airspeed, and you land slight tailwheel to 2 point would be ideal. But what you'll see initially in training and in some of the videos is going to be a tailwheel first landing is what we're trying to train to initially for the new new pilots so that way they don't really have any extra flying airspeed and it, it gets them away from from bouncing or skipping which could be dangerous in this particular airplane because right. if you, uh, you skip it land it off the main gear and then uh you know pull up too hard and then the aircraft stalls out you could be up three four five feet and uh with some of the sensors that we have uh, essentially being irreplaceable it's it could be catastrophic as far as uh, what what you imagine it would be like to stall from five feet and smash it in. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> wow, that's, that's yeah. So it has on takeoff though it has supports on the wings, right? But you don't have that on landing. Yeah. So the big thing is is they're called the pogos, and when you taxi out, they're going to be you'll see streamers off of the little wheels that are in the wings. And those pogos allow us to taxi around. And before takeoff, once we're on the runway and we're stopped, the, uh, the mobile is going gonna, is gonna to be out there in the chase car, and they kind of drive around you and uh, check you over one last time before you take off. But we also have a pogo crew out there, the people that uh, – maintainers that are going to be out there, and they, they will unpin the pogo. They'll unpin the uh, emergency start system, hydrazine, much like – actually – yeah. You're, you're very familiar with that. Yeah, being a Viper dude. Uh, we're essentially the same engine as you guys with that non after burning uh, Viper motor, essentially, the okay. F 118. So, yeah, the, the they unpin that. So, so now that's armed. And then uh, unpin the wheels so that they'll fall out on takeoff. So, essentially, as the aircraft takes off, the lift 
from the wings that wings will lift up and then you'll see the pogos fall out and uh and then yeah now you're now you're two wheels only and uh off you go so uh, when you come back same thing once you land people always ask oh, huh? you know what what happens with the wing well it's actually titanium skid plates on each side of the wing tip okay. uh, yeah. so it's actually designed to come to a complete stop dragging on one of the wings and then it'll just pop it off and then throw a new one on whenever uh whenever it grinds down all the way but awesome yeah yeah well do you have any cool u2 stories you want to share from there so there i was u2 stories that you can even yeah. talk about <laughs> Let's see. As far as there was now, you know, the funny thing is, is the first time you go high, right? This it's an incredible climb rate. I, I mean, you're climbing over 10,000 feet per minute. You could be 10,000 feet above the airfield on initial takeoff. I mean, it's wow. like over the over the runway if, you, if you're doing a full length on a lightweight jet. I mean, it's it's absolutely unreal. The uh, how steep and how fast this thing climbs. So you have to see it in person to understand it. And feeling like it, it throws you in the seat too. I mean, when you power it all the way up, it throws you back hard i mean yeah. like nothing nothing else i've ever I've felt before and i've driven some pretty fast cars and you know fly 38 and all that stuff but yeah it's nothing like it so it throws you back in the seat and it just it just rockets off and unlike a fighter where you know you guys i, I still remember when you came out yeah. to a visit here at shepherd and yeah i'll have to dig that video up so i've got it could, uh, i've got i've yeah. used it on the channel before i need to give you credit uh, for it. Like, yeah nice man yeah I, i'll always remember that but yeah so like you guys, you know, you always, you, you get going real fast, you know, I don't know, four or 500 knots, whatever, and, and just rip it straight yeah. up. Our, yeah. Ours, we just take off and off we go, and it just sets that climate, you know, and you'll be 40 degrees nose high sometimes, and just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> and it just rockets off. So, yeah, on my first one, we're flying up and passing through the KC-10 ceiling. I was through that in, you know, minutes, and, and it's like, oh my God, I just... I am now higher than I've ever flown in an airplane, and it's just been like, I don't know, 10 minutes, something like that. It's it just absurd climb rate. And keep on climbing and keep on climbing. I'm way up there, you know. I'm looking down, like, huh, you know, I, I thought it would – I guess you have ideas. I, I probably talked to the rest of the guys and probably somewhat similar, but you're looking around and you're like, oh, I'm high up here, but it's not – not like what you would think. Right. So it's not like, oh, I'm an astronaut and there's this tiny little earth, you know, the sphere down there. And you're like, I'm, you're looking down and everything's pretty small. But the the thing that really kind of hammered it home was I saw a contrail of an airliner below me. And, uh, yeah, you see the airliner way down there. And it's as far below you or further than it is above the earth. So the same way that, you know, you see a tiny airliner way up there and it's just streaking across the sky, putting the contrail out, the, if you look down and it's below you doing the exact same thing. And that was for us, oh my gosh, I guess I am way up here. So, <laughs> so that was, yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. But, but you're, yeah, that, that's one of the most memorable things I could think of. And then another one, this, uh, someone had asked me if the stars twinkle when you're up there and I guess because the majority the atmosphere, I guess is what, what right. makes the stars and lighting and stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I was thinking well, we're above the majority of, of a lot of the atmosphere up where we're flying. And I was thinking, yeah, I, I don't know. I've never actually noticed that. So next time I went up there, I looked and sure enough. Yeah, it was, it was just solid, you know, solid stars. So, I mean, they weren't really twinkling like they do from the ground. So that, that was kind of, the flat earthers are going to want to know, do you yeah. see curvature or is it just flat and then you fall off the face of the earth? What What is the definitive I mean, answer? Uh, you know, I, there I was. I flew all the way to the edge of the earth. And I looked down. <laughs> and I turned back around. I didn't want to go off. No, no. No, it's, it's definitely round. It, it, it's, it, it's, it is comical that that's even a thing. But whatever, man. You know, if, if people want to believe it and it makes them happy, then, then so be it. Whatever. It, it seems like I, I'm doing a lot of general aviation, and, and it yeah. feels like 
the uh, the age. I guess maybe I don't see as many people our age out there doing it, or maybe even younger. So uh, definitely want to. You see all sorts of car channels and all this stuff. You know, everyone driving around in cars, and and I don't think a lot of people they re- think that flying is just absolutely inaccessible. You can't afford it. Yeah. And there's so great airplanes out there that are no more than the cars that they're buying. Uh, maybe a little bit more in maintenance, but still the you could go out there and you could fly relatively inexpensively. So want to try to highlight that and try to at least encourage people to go out and fly. It's uh, it's how I ended up here. You know, I started out with GA, same thing you know, with with you, right? You were flying GA, and and that's where a lot of us get our starts. And people always ask me, it's, oh man, it's, you know, I'm standing at a, a 38 or a U2, and oh man, it's it must not be very exciting to see all these other airplanes and there's, you know, some civil air patrol Cessna. I'm like, no, actually I really enjoy hopping in this little Cessna and going out and flying. And it's just different when you have your own mission, which is to just have fun versus go out and execute, uh, whatever you're out there trying to accomplish and whatever training sort of you're going to do. So the, the pure joy of just general aviation is, is so much fun. And, I, I just can't emphasize how like much I think people should get out there and do it, especially if you ever wanted to fly and, and just think, oh, I can't do it now, or I'm too old, this, that. You know, there's always multitude of, of reasons. Just uh, you know, try to figure out how to make it work, and then don't give up on it because it, it is fun, even if you're not in a fighter or you're not in a, a U2 or a 38. Yeah. You, so you, I've seen, you know, we're, we're Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. You're yeah. constantly, like you were out at Pitt, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you were out sure. flying T-6s, was it T-6s yeah. and stuff? I mean, you're, you're out doing general aviation stuff all the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll plug these guys, Texas Aviation Academy. If you're anywhere in San Antonio area, they're out in New Braunfels. These guys are awesome. Uh, really, really, really good people. Uh, they have some really cool airplanes, very knowledgeable, and they love aviation they're just it's like a family so if you ever have a chance to go out to stop by texas aviation academy they, they are awesome good people that's who i was flying with a whole bunch and yeah. man it, it just it made me remember just like wow you know i I've, i was out there flying a little aronka champ and that little tail dragger you know here i am a u2 pilot you know and and that thing humbled me i was trying to land this thing like, <laughs> God, how this things got under what probably under 100 horsepower? I don't know, 65 yeah. horsepower. And like, yeah, how hard can it be? And it's like, oh man, <laughs> that's amazing. It's fun. Uh, well, so yeah. part of the YouTube program, you guys have stolen jets from us. So I, I want to talk about it because yeah. it's near and dear to my heart. Y'all have T-38As, the exact same ones I'm currently flying. In fact, one of them is one of the ones I used to fly. Uh, talk about the companion program and kind of your T-38 experience now versus when you were a student. Yeah, uh, well, there's a whole lot less to look at. So as you <laughs> As you know, with the A model, there's there's no heads up display, all the, the Gucci screens and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's and it's it's just different, right? Because we are not operating them in the same manner that that you would as uh, as an aggressor pilot, and then as the same as even a, a UPT student. So it's uh, it is a companion trainer. Uh, costs less money for us to or for the Air Force to get us hours in that compared to the U two. There's not a ton of U twos. Um, we have we have the U2s out out and about wherever they are, and so yeah, for us to be able to get flight hours and, and continually uh, sharpen our skills, the T38 is a perfect airplane for that. And it's funny because you look at the approach speed of a 38, right, and doing a 155 at base plus gas or 170 plus gas for your no flaps, right? So you're doing that, and then you go fly a U2, which is approaching Cessna 172 speeds, you know, you're down at 70-something knots. Wow. Yeah. I don't, you're like, how the heck do these things translate? Well, completely, it's it's funny. The 38 forces you to have an incredibly fast cross-check, so the, uh, as, as you know, so you had to fly that thing well, you have to have a, a pretty decent cross-check, and then same thing with the U2, uh, maybe not necessarily when you're, when you're coming in on final, you've got a little bit of time to think, but once you're inside 10 feet, that's that's where it gets really tough and, and you gotta be pretty quick. So the two airplanes kind of complement each other in that that regard. We uh, do formation training in the in the 38, and that's 
that's always challenging and forces you to be a better pilot thinking about a wingman or if you're on the wing still just being in good position and and all the stuff that comes with that we do low level training so we still fly low levels yeah you were in star wars canyon right that was a really cool picture Uh, of that yeah yeah great uh very very cool the Big thing with it is, yeah, it just forces you to be a better pilot, and and you have to maintain dual quals in two different airplanes, so multiple check rides, multiple bolt face to memorize all that. The yeah, it's just it's definitely demanding, but one of the unique and cool aspects of the program getting to fly around in black T thirty eights. We've got some cool paint jobs. Yeah. I'd like to point out that the uh, that F sixteen, I think, that just got painted black and red or whatever. Yeah. We, we had it first. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the uh, Nellis F-16 that stole our paint job. Well, stole your yeah. paint job, but you know, yeah, that's that's cool. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. well, that's good stuff, man. So, bef- parting shot. Um, what kind of car do you drive as uh, a car guy? What's what's your what's your passion on the car side? Yeah, you know, obviously it started out, uh, you know, with old muscle cars. I had a 70 Dodge Challenger, had a uh, old uh, Z28, 98, LS1 Z28, which is a lot of fun. Uh, had a uh, 91 NSX, which was a lot of fun. That was a, a really cool car. It was supercharged. Man, fantastic driving. driving Did you get car. rid of it? Yeah, I oh, sold it. Actually. Oh, oh, I thought you still had it. Yeah. Do you have a sports car now? Yeah, I've got a uh, I've got an 06 M3. So oh, cool. the uh, I've got a competition uh, coupe car. It's uh, the Interlagos Blue. So it's a sweet car. Uh, yeah. A lot of fun. Parting shots. I appreciate you being on the channel. And uh, you know, I know it's the the audience here is a lot of, you know, people wanting to get in the pipeline, in which I think your story is really going to help them. People that you know are, are like I just had a guy uh, email me the other day and say, hey. I didn't get the I didn't get the fighters that I thought I wanted or deserved or whatever. Um, what advice do you just have for young dudes just you know starting this career or wanting to get into this career or young girls too? When I say dudes, I, I, every anybody, right? It's all inclusive. And, and dudes is, is yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gender neutral, right? So I mean, everyone's a dude. So uh, yeah, I, I get it. So no, for for everyone that's looking to do this, I, I think it's important that. The, you know, you just continue to do well in whatever you're doing, which is school prim- uh, primarily, right? So so do well in school and, and try not to, uh, I, I don't know, it, don't get lost being too focused on, on what the end goal is way down here. Mm. Um, try to enjoy enjoy your youth, you know? I mean, it's, it's a short time of your life. And um, man, I was looking through, you know, all the pictures I'm, I'm trying to get to you and I'm looking at pictures of me soloing a, a T6 or a 38. It's, it's like almost nine years ago, and and like God, you know, and that was that was when you showed up. I mean, you were there nine years ago, man. So um, yeah, it, it's it's nuts how fast it goes. But so that's that's one of the things that I think is important. The uh, the don't let other people's negative attitudes uh, discourage you because the. One thing that I've, I've actually told, uh, we have, uh, I have a couple of crew chiefs, former U2 crew chiefs that are uh, now in pilot training right now. And cool. man, they hard, as a husband and wife, actually, pretty incredible they, uh, what they've accomplished going through this. But big thing is, as, uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be people that, you know, uh, I don't, and I don't know in their particular case, but in other people's cases of, people that I've worked with that were former enlisted and people telling them, no, you know, they can't do it and kind of give them discouragement. And they're like, yeah, they're kind of telling me uh, not to try this. I'm like, dude, don't, don't, you know, <laughs> but just like you said, don't, don't let people bring you down. If that's your dream, then go for it. And you got to realize, I mean, it, you're in this sense, you actually are competing against people. And, um, like I said before, you're competing against yourself as the best that you could possibly do. But, you know, getting good grades and and preparing for tests, working hard. Hey, doggy. Uh, <laughs> still in the snow, man. He's had an, he's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, It's hard work, and but it is worth it, you know. If if that's what you want to do and that's your dreams, then, then continue to work for it. Then if it doesn't work out, I mean, if you make it to, to pilot training and, and – 
just like you're you're saying the person didn't make it to the T one or made it to the T one. Dude, I, I guarantee a couple of years, I think they'll look back on it wherever they end up. They're gonna be they're gonna be like, wow, you know, I'm glad I know these people. It almost, maybe not, maybe it wasn't your ultimate goal. Maybe that wasn't your dream, but you know, the small number of people that get to do that, man, and and you have to look at it realistically. And and it's it's so funny. Yeah, I guess as you get older, but. Ultimately, it is service, right? I mean, you, you are you are serving, and, and it's it's not about you, and it's you have to remember the the bigger the bigger picture and looking at it that way, and then have a good attitude because you know people people notice. pick up on that. Yeah, people notice. You get opportunities. Yeah, it's very important. So, you know, if there's there's I've heard of stories of people going to heavies and just having a bad attitude about it. And, you know, like, Oh, I flew T 38s. And, and so T 38 pilots in, in heavy worlds, uh, have had, have unfortunately created names for themselves. And, and, you know, it, it's, so you almost have to go in and, and break that, break that, uh, preconceived, I guess, idea, uh, that maybe you're going to have a bad attitude about it because you didn't get what you wanted. But, that's that's not that should not be the way you go about right. handling right. you know disappointment. It, it is what it is, you know. And and just remember for for that person, there's also somebody that wanted a pilot slot that didn't get it, you know. And and they would do anything to be in that T1. And there's plenty of people that are, you know. I I talk to people at air shows all the time and like, man, I really really wish I had had applied and to become a pilot or try to do this. And uh, I cannot tell you how many people I've met. And, and that's sad to me, man, you know? So the, I, I hate that because I, I would love for everybody to, you know, to go follow their dreams and, and try to do this. So just remember you, you're young once you've got your, if you're young and you have this, uh, have the ability or the opportunity to try to become a pilot, go for it because, you know, again, you've got pretty much one shots and, I think your other videos touched pretty well on the rest of it as far as telling you now and all that. So I'll let you I'll <laughs> link those videos. And <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Those, I think those, those pretty much, you know, yeah. pretty much nail on the head. But the, yeah, the big thing for me is, is I, I was in a job that I did not like, you know, and I quit and here I am. It was the best decision I've ever made. So just, you know, if, if that's if you're in that type of position and you were uh, looking to do OTS and your dream is to be a pilot, then go for it. You know, there's there's plenty of opportunities, whether it's the Guard, Reserve, Navy, Marines. I mean, whoever it is, just go out there and uh, and make it happen. But yeah, yeah, that's that's what I tell. You. It's not a straight path. It always curves and the branches. You never it just you get so folk target fixated on the end that you forget about the middle. You know. Exactly. And, you know, the OTS route is great as, as far as how, how quick you could become an officer, right? So, I mean, we did, what, 13 weeks? I think it's now nine weeks and yeah, some cases less. I, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds great, but it, it's, it's the work. numbers are it's, – it's competitive. And so if you know you want to do this and you're younger, you're still in high school, you're in college, you know, look at ROTC, look at the academy. There's prep school. There's all sorts of stuff. Talk to – recruiters that could get you into those particular things and then uh, go there and just be the absolute best that you possibly could be and uh whether that's put a put a picture of a of a jet on your wall and every morning when you wake up you look at it and, and think that man that's there's my motivation go do that and that's it's important to remember what you're working towards but you know don't get lost in that and like you said don't get lost and so target fixated on it and because again um your your ideas of what being a fighter pilot might be like or whatever whatever you want to do it might not be exactly you know yeah. what it's backed up to be right so if you told me 10 years ago that hey you're going to be a youtube pilot and you know i would have laughed and they're like yeah okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's crazy just how things work out and and the past we end up on but the, uh, the important thing is, yeah, just just yeah, try to try to have a good attitude about it and and make the best of whatever you've got because some things are out of your control and and for us when we went through and my class 
it's there's just they weren't handing out a ton of fighters right so and from there is you just you take the path that you're on and, and do the best that you can and make the most of it and try to be a good officer while you're out there too you know i mean that's important and and uh you know bring up the people around you and make the place a little bit better than it was before uh you got there and i think that's uh you can't really do much more than that awesome well brother i appreciate it man thanks for uh thanks for being on the channel thanks for telling your story and uh thanks for helping out the uh the next generation of hopefully u2 pilots kc10 pilots air force officers so thanks exactly. so much and uh, i we appreciate it yeah and if you see me out in the air show circuit or wherever i think actually we're doing a uh air show at Beal this, uh, this uh, I think it's May of 2020. So we're going to have an open house at the base. We're going to be doing YouTube demonstrations, flybys, and we're going to have a really good air show uh, put together. So yeah, if you see me out there, be sure to say hi. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. All right. We'll see you. Really enjoyed talking to Splint. Uh, I appreciate him being on the channel. He's got a great story. Uh, make them tell you no, as always, the, the, the results, as you can see. You, know, you just have to buckle down, uh, love the one you're with, so to speak, and uh, uh, be the best you can be in the position you are and not get too far ahead of yourself. But uh, great story. Uh, I appreciate his time. He will have, uh, hopefully we'll have him back on the channel in the future, but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Oh! About a lot of that. Really fine with the doors off. All box two. Don't be a douche. Rule number one. Make them tell you now.